sing it to him. Oh, victory belongs to Jesus. Let your faith rise tonight. Victory belongs to our God. No matter what I'm facing, no matter what it may look like, I will sing oh. I choose to believe. Jesus. Thank you for freedom, oh God. Thank you for the refreshing wind of the Holy Ghost, Jesus. Any time or place, we can just lift our hands and tap into victory and tap into strength and renewal and refreshing. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Did anybody come to praise him tonight?
Well, that's it. Why don't we praise him? Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, come on. You don't got to stop just because the music stopped. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, Lord, we praise you. Amen, amen. We magnify you. How many of you are happy to be in the house of the Lord on a Tuesday evening? Amen. No better place to be than in the house of the Lord. Why don't you just take a few minutes? Why don't you shake somebody's hand or hug their neck? Let them know you're happy to see them in the house of the Lord on a Tuesday night. Oh Lord, we praise, oh Lord, we praise, oh Lord, we praise, oh Lord, I lift it up, oh Lord, we praise, oh Lord, we praise, oh Lord. Amen. One more time as we return to our seats, why don't we sing this song? Oh Lord, we praise, 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 oh Lord. Please remember, this coming Monday, October 31st, is our annual Harvest Fest. It will be from 7 to 9 p.m. at the Donna Cordova Center. There are prizes for those of you participating in the game booths. First place is $100. Fifth, or yeah, 50th place. <laughs> My Lord, help us. Second place is $50. If you get 50th place... Better, better luck next time. Um, if you are coming to that, for anyone and everyone coming to that, please bring a bag of candy for the children and all the adults that are still trying to be children. Because <laughs> we all know that some of the parents go digging through their child's bags Amen. to get the best candy out. And just tell them, we're teaching you how to tithe. You can get to pay 10%. 
So please, if you're going to be there, it's always a lot of fun. There's a lot of godly, family-friendly fellowship at every Harvest Fest. So please be there. If you're going to be there, bring a bag of candy. Also, coming up Friday, December 9th this year at 7.30 p.m. is our last bomb outing of 2022. It will be held at the Flying W Ranch. If you do not know what this is, this is a dinner show. So basically you show up, they feed you an amazing dinner, and then you get to partake of the fun, family-friendly show that happens afterward. The cost is 65 per person. You have to RSVP by the 9th of November. You have to, our bishop already said he's going. That is his RSVP right there. Bishop is going. <laughs> and so is Sister Elder. Mom, he just RSVP'd you right there. Please RSVP by November 9th to RSVP. Get a hold of Brother Tim or Sister Crystal McDonald. You can RSVP through them. Now, what does this include? The price of $65 per person includes a dinner, which is double smoked ham, smoked turkey breast, garlic mashed potatoes, garlic asparagus with shallots, Dutch oven buttermilk biscuits, which sounds very good, fruits of the forest pie, water, coffee, iced tea, and lemonade. There are soft drinks at an additional cost if you would like that. After you eat your dinner, there is a Christmas show, which is music and entertainment, which is provided by the Flying W Wranglers. I have not got to go since they rebuilt this. It burnt down a few years ago, but everyone I have talked to said it is even better than it was before, and it is absolutely worth the money. So find somewhere to stash your children for a few hours, if you have children, and then get your husband or your wife and sign up for that and be there. You do not want to miss that. Also, coming up very quickly, it is October 29th at 8.30 a.m. Right here, there is a, minister, a ministerial tag-in for all the department heads, for all the ministerial heads. And there is youth Bible study the same day, October 29th. It will be in Colorado Springs. If you want to be a part of that, young people, get in touch with Sister Melody Elder and be at the church at 11 a.m. so you can be a part of that. Now, with all of that out of the way, if you would place our memory verse up on the screen, please. O Israel, trust thou in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. Ye that fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. The Lord hath been mindful of us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless them that fear the Lord, both small and great. The Lord shall increase you more and more, you and your children. If you believe that with faith in your heart, go ahead and bring your tithes and offerings this evening.
I want you to grab a praise partner. If you're ready for revival, I want you to grab a partner and come down here to the front. Everybody, grab a partner and come down here to the front. We're gonna see revival in our city. We're gonna see revival in our families. We're gonna see revival in our neighborhoods, in our communities, in our schools, at our jobs. I want everybody to come with a partner. See, when two or three are gathered in his name, he'll be in the midst. And it's more than enough people for him to be in the midst in this place. If you want revival, I want you to shout like you want it. I want you to dance like you want it. I want you to clap like you want it. I want you to scream like you want it. Come on, y'all, here we go. Here we go. Yes, I want it. Yes, I want it. Yes, I want it. Don't you feel it? Can you feel it? The fire of the Holy Ghost in this place. Now have five about five people on your way back to your seats and say, I feel that fire moving in this place. Oh, well, that's all right to praise him. Why don't you lift up your voice to God with the voice of triumph? Come on, somebody shout out to him. Hallelujah. Amen. God is moving in this place. I'm so excited for what he's about to do in these next few minutes. And if you're ready for what God wants to do in this place, why don't you lift up your hands and lift up your voice? as Bishop comes to preach the word of the Lord. Everybody, let's praise him tonight. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord, we love you, we praise you. We honor you, we praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. What a 
wonderful, good spirit we feel in this place tonight. I'm excited about what Jesus is doing. I want to say, you, you can be seated for a minute. Uh, I don't talk much about this, but I think it's important uh, um, to pay attention to what's going on around you. I know you don't hear much about this in church anymore. Maybe we should. But I encourage each and every one of you to vote. If you're an American citizen, that is one of your... Well, that was kind of anemic. Let me try that again. I, I would encourage you to vote. If you don't vote, don't let me hear you griping about what's going on. Hallelujah. And pay attention to who you're voting for. Our options in Colorado are kind of pitiful. But it, if we could get some people that would give us the freedom to worship God, that would, and to have some kind of, I tell you, who, who will help me pray? It's like babies don't have a chance in Colorado. Did you know that they just passed the law in Colorado that you can abort babies clear up till birth? That mean, I, now this is going to get harsh, but some of you need to know. That means they take the legs of those baby, babies and pull them out of mama's womb. And right when the back of the skull is exposed, they thrust a sharp object up into the brain of that child and kill that child. And they crush the skull and suck the brains out. Brothers and sisters, I, I cannot morally stand for any of that. Life is precious. And I, I, I just pray every day that God will give us leaders. The Bible says to pray for the leaders of our nation. I don't only pray, I vote. And I pay attention to who I vote for. Praise God. And if, they're, if they don't take strong stands against uh, homosexuality and abortion, and those are moral issues. Those are not political issues. Don't let them make those political issues. Praise God. And uh, thank God you live in a country where you have the freedom and the opportunity to vote. A lot of nations don't have that opportunity, but we do. So don't discard it. Don't listen to the pundits and the media telling you it's not important. It is important. Praise God. And so that is my blurb for this political session. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We have been having some wonderful lessons around here. And uh, I was praying today, we, you know, I was thinking, God, we need another revival. We need an evangelist to come in here. And, uh, and I'm praying about that. But I also feel like that there needs to be an establishment in, in this church. It has so many new people. You know, as they come in, you don't realize that there are new people. And I kind of short crowd tonight, but hopefully some of them are watching online as well. I will tell you openly, you'll never get me to agree that online is as good as being here. <laughs> Praise God. One of these nights, I'm going to get a big old steak out. And give everybody a steak. And tell them, well, if you'd have been here. And I'm going to talk about how good it is. I'm going to let the juice run off of my chin. You just, you can't virtually experience that. And the Bible said, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. There's something about when God's body comes together. There's nothing like it in the world. Praise God. But, but if you're online, we're glad you're online. In, in listening or watching this tonight I, I started a lesson on the Sabbath and I, I wanted to finish that but I don't think that I have it down the way I want it down and I don't want to run a half done job on such an important issue so I will come back and I will deal with that all of this is part of a very subtle uh, series of lessons that I am dealing with that deals with the commands of God, the, the principles of God, 
and and uh, the the commands of the Lord and let's and the laws of the kingdom of God because we are not a lawless people we are not a kingdom of anarchy our law is the law of the spirit nevertheless it is the law that governs the spirit of God the spirit of God in us governs our spirit and our thought process and our behavior and we are not antinomian grace people I, in fact I preached on the grace of God a couple Sundays ago and made it very clear that the grace of God hath appeared unto all men teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust praise God and so I want to deal with that again in a great deal tonight and I am going to read my text so I'm going to see what time it is if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 15. First Peter chapter 1 and verse number 15. Much of this will be borrowed from other apostolic preachers, and I don't have time to give credit to them, but so let me give credit to all of them. And uh, thank you for all of them. And when I have time, I will acknowledge them I thank God for my raising and I thank God for men of God that gave me the resources to teach the stuff praise God first Peter 1 15 but as he which hath called you is holy so be ye holy in all manner of conversation because it is written be ye holy for I am holy let me try that again but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. And so we want to deal with this in, a, in a, another detail of this tonight. This, the Sabbath is part of God's holiness. And, uh, and so uh, we'll get to that. A little later, but I want to talk about this. But before I do that, can you put your Bibles down and let's ask God to speak to us tonight. Will you lift your voice with me and together as the body of Christ, let's give the praise to God that he is worthy of. Can we do that right now? God, we thank you and we praise you. Thank you for these wonderful people that have come here tonight to worship and to to learn your word and whatever else that you have for us tonight God let your word be hid in our heart to keep us from the snares of the fowler we believe you for it we praise you for it and everybody said in Jesus name you may be seated holiness is the reflection of God of who God is born out of love for God and His Word. Uh, in fact, the Bible tells us, for by grace are you saved, and that grace is through your faith. It's not of yourself. It is the gift of God. It is the gift of God. And so, God bestows to us His grace. He comes into us. The grace of God hath appeared unto all men. How did the grace of God appear unto all men? Through Christ Jesus. He was the, he was the manifestation of God's grace to all of lost humanity. And so it reflects in our life. And if you have much understanding, if, if the Son shines off of the water and you do not have any kind of shield against the reflection of that sun shining off the water whether you were in direct sunlight or whether you weren't the reflection will still be manifest in your life you will come to church and people will say you have been in the sun well actually I was wearing a hat but the sun was reflecting off of the water. And so it is 
with God's holiness. If you really have the Holy Ghost and you are really in the presence of God, it will, it will reflect in your life. You can see it. You can feel it. Uh, it's not that way with what the world calls legalism. Now, there are many people that are, that are trying to, to sweep all of the word of God under the banner of legalism. And so they, they teach another kind of grace that is known as antinomian grace. Grace without law. And grace without any kind of accountability to God. That's not grace. That's somebody fulfilling their own desires and their own lust. And, and just making uh, the, the kingdom of God to be whatever they want it to be in their mind. But real grace is reflected in our life. And, and I want to say this because I've dealt with this so much. There's a huge deal in our world today that any time that God's grace has any kind of strings of accountability and any kind of demands in our life, which it will, the grace of God will demand accountability and the grace of God will correct us. But we live in a world that is so dysfunctional and many of them have been so beat up by various aspects of life that any form of correction is defined in their mind as abuse. And so you find people that can't get a job because every time the boss tells them what to do, they'll say, well, he's abusing me. No, he's not. He's trying to teach you how to do your job right. Or some, you know, some kids acting out in school. And so the teacher says, you either got to straighten up or you're going to the principal. Well, that's abuse. No, that's not abuse. That's correction. Listen, brothers and sisters, if you do not allow that in your life, it will be brought to your life in confinement. Up to solitary confinement. I would rather have the grace of God teach me how to live right than a prison officer teach me. How to live right. Can the church say amen? amen? Novelist Lloyd Douglas tells about a man who went to visit his old violin teacher and asked the teacher, What's new? I'll tell you what's new, said the teacher. He grabbed his tuning fork and he banged it, the tuning fork at 256 cycles per second, vibrated the C note which came out loud and clear. Do you hear that? That's a C, he proclaimed. Now upstairs a soprano rehearses endlessly, and she's always off key. Next door I have a cello, a cello player who plays his instrument very poorly. There's an out-of-tune piano on the other side of me. I'm surrounded by terrible noise at night and day, plunking the C again, he continued. Do you hear that? That's ANSI today. It will be ANSI tomorrow. It will never change. Some of you will get that. You're not a musician. When the Bible talks about he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the church. And if, not, if, if you're not careful, you can... You can get used to things that are out of tune. You can, you know, this, I have a hard time with this because my mama was a musician and my grandpa was a musician and all of my aunts and uncles were musicians. And when you go to a family reunion at, at the Chilton Place, it sounds like the Grand Ole Opry. There's so much talent there. In fact, some of them have played at the Grand Ole Opry, and, and that's not my style of music, but they're, they're musicians. And, and so you, when somebody's off key, I have to learn how to extend to them grace because I want to tell them, you're flat, you're sharp. And I used to do that quite often, but I've tried to be a little more gracious about it. But... You can get used to living in a world that tolerates everything except biblical absolutes. People are quick to embrace anything out there, but they will not embrace, nor will they even touch, biblical truths. 
Our world is running headlong toward accepting everything in fear of offending. It's running headlong toward accepting everything in fear of offending. Quick to accept all but God. We, we, we don't care how wicked things seem. We want to espouse the supposed doctrine of toleration. But we don't tolerate the things of God. Well, they don't. I do. I want to fall in love with the Word of God. The Word of God emphatically forbids our altering its message. Deuteronomy 12, 32 says, Whatsoever, What things soever I command you, observe to do it. Thou shalt not add thereto, thou shalt not add thereto, nor diminish from the Word of God. Proverbs 30 and 6 says, Add Thou not unto his word, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. I'm going to tell you something, brothers and sisters. All of this stuff of embracing wickedness, we are seeing the end results of it. And people are beginning to see this won't work. This is not going to work. You cannot have lawlessness. You cannot have, you cannot live in a world that does not have mores. There has to be mores or the, the, the diverse winds will toss you until your life is torn apart. The Bible talks about that. The Bible talks about whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them shall be likened unto a wise man which built his house upon the rock. The rock was the, the word of God. Christ Jesus. Matthew 5, 18 says, Verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Revelations 22 and 18 says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. I hope you weren't asleep on that. So the next time you try to add your non-binary sexuality and your homosexuality and gay and lesbian lifestyle and all of that kind of stuff, we love those people, but God doesn't tolerate that any more than he tolerates fornication. He doesn't tolerate that any more than he tolerates adultery. He doesn't tolerate that any more than he does murder or hatred or slander. Anyone that shall add unto these things shall God add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the word of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Ecclesiastes 12 and 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and, and if you feel like it, do his commandments. Just saying if you're awake there. Fear God and keep his commandments. I want to tell you something. Now, I thought it was 244 revolutions per second. Whatever the standard C is, it never changes. And I can hear it, Brother Richard. My ear can hear it. If it's out of tune, I hear that. Whoa, 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 whoa. It drives me up a wall. Get in tune. We got another way we used to say that around here. Get right, church, and let's go home. How many of you want to be right with God? Get right, church. Let's get in tune with the Word of God. Hallelujah. That some things are like the standard C, the, the C pitch. Uh, in the music world, they, they don't change. They don't change even slightly. If you change them slightly, you destroy the whole thing. 
Holiness principles never change. I don't care what era. It don't matter from the 1700s, the 1800s, the 1900s, the 20th century, or the 21st century. Holiness is holiness. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see God. The way that we dress is important to God. Did you know we're one of the last vestiges of Christianity that believe that our appearance is important to God? Our hair is important to God. The long and the short of it. We'll get to that here eventually. Praise God. We, while I'm on that subject, we'll just go through it here quickly. We don't dye our hair any more than we paint our faces. We don't paint our fingernails. I don't have black fingernails tonight. I hate dirty fingernails. I try to clean them up as much as possible. I don't paint them. I don't put a clear coat on them. I don't put pink coats on them. We don't want to be fake. I'm not knocking you. I'm just saying we're not fake. Hallelujah. And our apparel, our adornment is extremely important to God. Can you clap your hands to him? Praise God. One writer puts it like this. Nicholas was a proselyte of Antioch. He was one of the first seven church deacons chosen to look after the business matters of the early church. We find this in Acts chapter 6, verse 3 through 5. You can put that up here while I continue to read this. This is where they are chosen by the church. I will come back and we'll talk about church government too because that's important too. Notice that these deacons were not chosen by the men of God. They were chosen by the church members. They were breveted. The leadership of the church was, was those people in the church that other people in the church had confidence in. That's why you need to break the habit of gossiping and slandering and talking about your brother or sister because God may want to use you as a leader in the church. And you're tearing down your own influence when you talk about other people and when you gossip about other people and when you slander about other people, you're destroying your own influence. And that's the gifts and the talents that God has given you. What do you say? Let's all be Christians and let's just put all that stuff away. That's what it says there. And, and Nicholas was one of these that God chose through the influence that he had with the church. However, his dedication to the apostolic message and his love for the truth was short-lived. According to early writings on heresy, Nicholas eventually backslid and introduced the doctrine of the Nicolaitans to the church. How many of you have heard me teach about the two doctrines in the book of Revelations that God hated? The, the doctrine of the Laodiceans and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. The Laodiceans were those that had no law. Leo, laity, people, diocese, ruled by the people. Whatever's the popular opinion ruled them. That church, God hated that. The Nicolaitans were those where there was a, a select group of people that were above everybody else. And they told everybody else what to do, but they didn't live what they told everybody else to do. They were very immoral. Nicholas was the one that started this. Diotrephes was probably a part of his influence in 3rd John where John writes and he says, but Diotrephes who loveth to have the preeminence and he tells, uh, what's the other one that he's writing to? I can't remember now, but he says, don't have any part with that. That's not the way that the apostolic church is run. We'll come back and we'll deal with that in detail. Nicholas eventually backslid and introduced the doctrine of the Nicolaitans to the church. His doctrine came about as a knee-jerk Reaction to the legalism of the Judaizers. It abused Paul's doctrine of the grace of God and introduced a false freedom into the church. Nicholas and his followers erred in, com in combating one extreme teaching with another their extreme teaching. I'm reminded that of the thing that my pastor told me when I was dealing with a particular is issue. Brother Wilson told me, you can't kill a devil by getting one. You can't kill... The wrong spirit by getting the wrong spirit. And so uh, in Revelations, John compared the Nicolaitans to Balaam in the Old Testament who cast a stumbling, a stumbling block before the children of Israel. Revelations 2, 14 and 15. You can see here where he talks about how that the doctrine 
Uh, but I have a few things against thee because thou hast them there that hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and commit fornication. Verse 15. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans which I hate. So there is a correlating uh, uh, spirit between the doctrine of the Nicolaitans and the spirit of compromise that Balaam uh, introduced Balaam was unsuccessful in cursing Israel from without but he taught them to mix godliness and worldliness I don't have time to read this but you can go home and read Numbers 22 chapter 22, chapter 23 chapter 24 and chapter 25 and, and because he taught them how to compromise and to intertwine the compromise with the things of God which we know as heresy how many of you know the difference between false doctrine and heresy? False doctrine is false. Trinitarianism is false doctrine. I, I, I'm not trying to insult anybody. In fact, I have nobody in mind when I'm teaching. I'm just, I am observing what the Bible and what history teaches us. And there's no such thing as Trinitarianism in the Bible. It, it, any, they will even acknowledge that it's a man-made doctrine. That it formulated through years of, 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 uh, what they call orthodoxy and, and what they call church fathers but they are not church fathers they, are, they, they compromised on the truth of the word of God however heresy will incorporate truth with false doctrine and so it mixes false doctrine with truth and it weaves it so timely, uh, so, so timely and so concisely that you move in and out of the false doctrine and the truth. And you do it so quickly that it all sounds so good. And, and so this is what happened with these people. And they cursed themselves from within. You can read this. God grew angry because they were actually going into the house of God and literally committing the act of fornication right in the house of God. You go read the story. What was his name? He was the son of, uh, he was one of the sons of, 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 uh, of Moses, Aaron. One of, the, one of the boys of Aaron. Was it Phineas or was he the one that, that did it? I don't remember, but I, I read it tonight. Can't believe it. I can't remember it right now. But the Bible says when he caught that young man, that was committing fornication right in the house of God, that he drove the spear through them and it went through the back of the man and through the belly of the woman, which makes it very plain. They were right in the very act of the horrible, immoral sin and they were doing it right in the house of God. And so we see that there was a compromise to God's worship and this happened and, and, and Nicholas started this stuff teaching required no outward or inward change to be saved Nicholas taught it attracted large numbers of converts from the pagan and the lukewarm church goers and so his message was why Live in legalism and bondage. Well, we are not living in legalism and bondage. We are covenant children. We don't live like the rest of the world. We're in covenant relationship with God. We are God's children. Any more than when you come to my house and you're spending the night in my house and you say, well, we don't do it that way at our house. Well, I tell you, well, that we do it that way at my house because this is my house. And if you're coming to my house, this is the way we do it. And Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of prayer and you're not going to make it a den of thieves and you're not going to do with it any old thing that you want to do with it because this is my house and we're in covenant relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God. And so uh, we can see that he taught holiness and sanctification was unnecessarily, as clearly seen in the New Testament. The original apostolic belief included standards of dress, types of activities participated in, and other codes of conduct. 
You can find this in Romans chapter 6, verse number 1, verse number 2. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Etc., etc. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. Your bodies. Don't tell me your body belongs to you. If you've got the Holy Ghost, your body belongs to God. <laughs> and we'll look at this here in a minute, but Paul was very clear. You don't take the temple of God and you use it for harlotry. That's what the Bible teaches. We don't do that. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3 through 7. 1 Timothy 2, verses 8 through 10. Hebrews 12, 14. And 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. All of this teaches us that this is God's way. Nicholas taught external holiness was not important. Now God looks at this in Revelations chapter 2 and verse number 6 at Ephesus and he says but this thou hast that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans which I also hate and he goes on to the church at Pergamos and he says I know thy works and where thou dwellest even where Satan's seed is and thou holdest fast my name they know the name of Jesus and hast not denied my faith they still preach the new birth even in those days where an Antipas, my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. But Ephesus, I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them, or in Pergamos, thou uh, hast them that holdeth the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which things I hate. God gives no little warning. Verse number 16, he says, Repent, or else I will come unto thee, and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So God is very clear that this stuff is serious to him. And I'm so sorry that so many churches today don't take the time to teach like I'm teaching tonight because they like the sensational side because it keeps the crowd moving, keeps everybody singing. And now the, the popular thing is, well, if you're going to teach that, you need to teach that in new converts class. That's the popular thing now. Well, we do teach it in new converts class. But we also teach it over the pulpit because this is the Word of God. Why in the world are you ashamed of teaching the things of the Word of God? An outward standard of holiness was the first thing to go in the falling away of the first century church. That was the first thing that, that Satan attacked through these doctrines. And it's... But after... The holiness left, this is the way that Satan always does this. You mark my words. Brother Westberger here, they're older than I am. They're not old, they're just older than I am. And they have seen it happen, and many of you that have lived for God any length of time, Satan makes a big deal out of how you look and how you dress and your outward conversations, and he says that's just not important. But that's not really what he's after. Because you watch those people after a while, there's no real repentance in the church. When everybody comes up here, there's no plea made for people in the altar to repent and to get away from their sin. And, and, and there's this peer pressure for people to get the Holy Ghost immediately. Well, let me tell you something. I don't think you have to tarry for years and years and years to get the Holy Ghost. But I'll tell you this, sometimes getting over the flesh is harder than getting rid of demons thank you for those three people that believe that I said sometimes getting past the flesh is harder than fighting the devil brothers and sisters and I thank God for a church that understands the value of repentance that's the first part of the new birth is repent 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 Repent, repent, or ye all likewise shall perish. And he came preaching the message of repentance. Getting 
out of this world is a big deal. Getting the world out of your heart is a big deal. Getting the world out of your conversation is a big deal. Getting the world out of your thought process is a big deal. Getting the world out of your behavior is a big deal. Getting the world out of your house is a big deal. Getting the world out of your marriage is a big deal. Getting the world out of your children is a big deal. You can't just tell them how to get it out of their life. You got to live it in front of them if you want to see them get it out of their life. How many of you thank God for the message of repentance? Uh, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Oh, clap your hands for that message. Here's the deal about repentance. You never, you never get past repentance. Repentance has to be a lifestyle. But when you allow worldliness in, there is no place for repentance. So the first thing to leave was repentance. And then the next thing to leave was, oh, is it really necessary to be baptized? Yes, it's necessary to be baptized. In the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. Somewhere, God, let that, let that break out in Pueblo, Colorado. Somewhere, break the false security that people have in this city where they feel like that they are ready to meet God and they have not been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Pull away their security, God. Don't let them sleep at night. Let there be a hunger for truth. And then eventually, speaking in tongues and the gifts of the Spirit left. You can see that in churches that used to be called Pentecost right here in this city. And they no long, their sign no longer says Pentecost. They've taken it off their sign. They used to be called Assembly of God, but they're not called Assembly of God anymore. They just want to be called particular names, church or point or some of the craziest names. 23.com. They had one up in Colorado Springs called Church of the Most High. And they were all smoking marijuana, getting high. That's the truth. You think I'm telling you I'm not but that's what happens when you get rid of repentance that's what happens when you think that this covenant is no big deal between you and God I'm going to tell you God looks at his covenant with his children like it's a marriage and if you don't think your covenant between you and God is a big deal then you probably won't think your covenant of marriage between you and your spouse is a big deal because it's the same spirit you can see that in the Old Testament. The Bible says when that harlot tempted that young man, she was an adulterer, and she tempted the young man, and she said, come with me. And the Bible says that she tempted him. She seduced him with her words. It's the same Hebrew word where we get our word doctrine from. She seduced him with her doctrine. I don't want to be seduced any way, shape, or form. I want to be in love. I want to be in covenant relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you clap your hands to him? And so the doctrine and the revelation of who Jesus was disappeared and we, we, we went into the age of orthodoxy. Hebrews chapter 12 verse number 14 says, Follow peace with all men and holiness without, no man, without which excuse me, no man shall see the Lord. Holiness is needed both now and for the rapture, you're not going to see God now and you're not going to see God in the rapture without holiness. God's holiness is one of the essential and absolute attributes of his divine nature. It's of great importance. His holiness was so important that over 900 times in the Bible, the word holy is in reference to God. In his command, be ye holy for I am holy. It is a special cause for awe and adoration to our God. 
It sets the standard for all other holiness. It will always remain higher than the highest holiness of men and angels, the holiness of God. It will always remain higher. It, is, it necessitates God's opposition to and the condemnation of all sin. It awakens the deepest and deepens, excuse me, man's consciousness of his own sin. Boy, that's a lost thing in the church anymore. I was with Brother Gary Howard last week, and I told him, I said, Brother, Brother Howard, I need you to come and preach for us. I want to tell you what I appreciate about this man. When this man preached, you can feel the conviction of God. Yeah, two or three of you. People get nervous when they feel the conviction of God anymore. Used to be people would get under conviction and they'd run to the altar. Now they get under conviction and get offended and leave the house of God. That shows how much that the human being is, is, is in control. I don't want to leave the house of God. When I get under conviction, I know where I want to go. I want to hit that altar. I want God to speak to my heart. I want God to wrestle with me like he wrestled with Jacob. You're not going to get a name change if you're afraid of a wrestling match with God and with yourself. How many of you have the attitude, I'm not going to let you go till you bless me, God. I know what's outside that door, and I don't want nothing to do with it. I want the favor of God in my life. I want the blessing of God. Covenant relationship has its benefits. Praise God. It sets before men their highest possible aspiration to be holy as God is holy. Praise God. And so the whole tone of Scripture is in accordance with the weighty exhortation of what I read for our text tonight. Be ye holy, for I am holy. Man appears in Scripture as a fallen, fallen being, which is unholy. And sinful. Although created in God's image, we lost one of the essential features of His image. We lost His holiness. We were created in true holiness. Praise God. But we lost that when we lost our initial essence. The word holiness comes from the Hebrew word, or the Akkadian and the Sumerian word, earth's earliest cultures. It's the Hebrew word kodesh and the Greek word hagiosune. Both continue in a green meaning, in an agreeing meaning, excuse me, which means to with, it is withdrawn. Scholars define holiness to mean separate or set apart. Set apart. You're not supposed to fit in. Holiness does not mean withdrawing from something, but holiness means withdrawing into something. I'm not being withdrawn from the world. I'm being drawn into the kingdom of God. Abraham, get thee out of thy country and out of thy kindred's house and go where I will tell thee. He didn't just call him out. He gave him a promise to go into. That's extremely important because so much of holiness today is taught in a manner where the Holy Ghost is not drawing anybody. If, it, if, if the Holy Ghost is not drawing you out and into, then chances are you're not going to stay. But if the Holy Ghost is doing it, let me tell you something. I went to, I, don't, I think I went to, uh, I don't remember what restaurant I went to. I went somewhere. But yesterday I went to a restaurant, no, Sunday morning, down the street from us where we were staying in the hotel. In Greeley, great breakfast, but the only seat they had was at the bar. Well, I really didn't want to sit at the bar, but I was hungry, and I didn't have a lot of time to wait. So I sat down there. And there was row after row of whiskey bottle, rum. I don't know what it all is. I, I, I don't, I'm so unfamiliar with that world. 
Uh, and all of that was right there in front of me. Did you know I had no desire? I didn't look at that lady and say, please stop me. Please stop me. Please don't let me do that. Now you may have. God may, may, he may not have given you that victory yet. But I'll tell you, if you'll keep walking in holiness, you'll get there. Because he's not just drawing you out. He's drawing you in. He's taking you somewhere. That's what holiness is all about, brothers and sisters. I had no desire for that because I had something else on my mind. I had getting drunk on the Holy Ghost in about 40 more minutes, uh, and I was sitting there, and I was scrolling through my notes as fast as I could, and that lady said, you look nice this morning, and I said, yes, ma'am, I'm on my way to church. I didn't give a rip about all that drink. I felt like Jesus. I have meat to eat that you know not of. And she said, oh my goodness. She said, is this how you observe the Sabbath? And I said, yes, ma'am. But this ain't the Sabbath. This is the first day of the week. The Holy Ghost is my Sabbath. And she looked like she swallowed a mule. Oh, and I said, here, why don't you come to church? Oh, no, I have my place where I practice the Sabbath. Well, hopefully the Holy Ghost will get a hold of her too. Because that is the Sabbath. What are you talking about, Brother Elder? I'm telling you, when you get the Holy Ghost, it's not hard to live this way. I'm not looking at the world wishing I had what the world had, just begrudging the fact that they're getting to do stuff that I don't get to do. You know what? If that's the way you feel, let me invite you back up to this altar. Let me introduce you to the Holy Ghost. Uh, why don't you just pray in the Holy Ghost for a little while and let Jesus get a hold of your heart. Praise God. Come on, Brother Richard. I always run out of time before I run out of notes. The Bible says, therefore, in Hebrews chapter 6, verse number 1, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on into perfection not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and the laying on of hands and of the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permit, for, uh, God permit, excuse me, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened to have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted of the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. If they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify them to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. In other words, those who quit believing fall away unless they turn back and fully embrace the principles of the doctrine of Christ and once again go into maturity. They cannot be renewed until they turn again. It, you, can't, you can't keep going on in your unrepentant way. Are you still with me? You can't keep going on in your unrepentant way. It's like somebody borrowing $50,000 from me and defaulting on the loan and then coming in two years later saying, hey, I need to borrow another $100,000 from you. I've got an apostolic song for you. Hit the road, Jack. Don't you come back no more. Thank you, Brother Richard. Now, do I love you? Yeah, I love you. Now, if you repent and pay the $50,000 back to me, 
I might consider it. Now, I know that's not a perfect analogy. But people want to leave stuff unresolved. That's why if you've treated a brother wrong, have the courage to just go say, Brother, help me take care of this. We're talking about repentance. But especially have the decency to come to God and say, Lord, how in the world did I think that I could live without you? Praise God. Most issues, well, let's back up here. Unger's Bible Dictionary, page 582, says holiness, so far as it appears in man, is an outcome of God's gracious work and salvation. And yet not without the proper ex- exertion of one's own free will and putting forth of the effort. I know this so well. You're saved by grace. Let me make this as clear as I possibly can. You cannot give yourself the Holy Ghost. God gives it to you. You can't even give yourself repentance. God grants it to you. Where's that in Acts? Then God hath granted unto the Gentiles repentance unto eternal life. Is that Acts chapter 10, chapter 11? So God grants all that to you. But you can't just sit there and say, well, it's, you know, it's mine. It's like somebody calling me and saying, you know, I just wrote you a $5 million check, but I, I can't take it to your bank because I'm, I'm not on your account. But I will give it to you if you will drive over to my house and pick it up. How fast do you think I will be at their house to pick that up? It don't matter. I'll pay you the speeding ticket. Who gives a rip? And that's the way that salvation has come to man God has made salvation possible through Jesus Christ before Jesus Christ came there was no salvation for humanity humanity was destined for hell it was lost Christ made it possible but you have to repent you have to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin and God will fill you with the Holy Ghost that's how it happens brothers and sisters don't let anybody tell you any different way And if you're going to stay on the road to heaven, you have to come back and repent again. And you have to come back and repent again. And you have to come back and repent again because that's the only way we're going to get to heaven. You can't drive from here to Denver without correcting that car I don't know how many times. Unless you got a Tesla. But somebody's correcting even that one. Because there has to be constant correction in our spirit, our fallen nature. Now, most issues of holiness may not necessarily be salvific issues. They could be Christian or maturity issues. But I'll tell you this, if you let them go unchecked, they will become salvific issues. How many of you understand that you just you have to correct the human spirit or it will become tainted this is where I'm going to stop tonight and I'll finish this next Tuesday night no I won't I'll be on my way to Israel but I'll finish it when I get home but how many of you want to be holy why don't you stand to your feet right now and let's lift our hands Brother Elder, how much are you going to preach on holiness till God gets done dealing with me? Because I want to be holy. How many of you want to be holy? 
I don't want a self-righteous spirit. I don't want a better than thou spirit. But I want a pure and a clean and a holy spirit. If that's the way you feel, can you just spend a few minutes in the presence of God tonight? Hallelujah. Praise God. Sister Carly. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on. Let's spend a few minutes in the presence of God. Let's don't allow this holy presence of God that we feel right now to just be a casual thing with us. Hallelujah. 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 that right now. How you feel tonight? I want to be more like you. Jesus, I want to be more like you. I want to be a vessel that you can use. I want to be more Don't talk to him. Sing it to him. I want to be more like you. Jesus, I want to be more like you. I want to be a vessel that you can use. I 
one more time with your hands raised. I want to be more like you. Jesus, I want to be more like you. I want to be a vessel that you can use. God for another time in your presence tonight God we understand there really is no holiness without the Holy Ghost so let your spirit continue to move in our lives let the precious power of your spirit permeate blow flow continue to change our hearts and our minds let the Holy Spirit of God bring enlightenment real enlightenment the real light as we read your word and we meditate upon your word go with every person in this house tonight as we leave Bless our families. Bless our marriages. Bring provision. But above all, God, let us live holy because you are holy. Keep us in your presence until we return again. And everybody said in Jesus' name. God bless you. You're dismissed. <laughs>